Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome to the 2022 UCLA Leadership Lab. My name is Dylan Stafford. I'm one of the co-hosts. Um, I'll be co-leading this event tonight with Dr. Kush Cooper. I represent a committee of people I'm going to introduce you to in just a moment. But um, on behalf of UCLA, welcome. You've been admitted to the number one public research university in America for the last five years running, according to US News and World Report. And in my opinion, US News and World Report must be very, very good at what they do because I like their outcome. And um, tonight you represent eight different graduate programs, uh, a microcosm of a much bigger universe, actually. You can earn a graduate degree in over 125 different disciplines at UCLA. So tonight is like a little appetizer for a much bigger universe. And of course we have the vaunted UCLA undergraduate program, the most applied to undergraduate program in the nation for coming up on a decade in a row. So it's quite the accomplishment that you earned your seat at UCLA, that you're trusting us with your graduate journey. And tonight is, um, is designed with love and it's designed with a little rigor. We're gonna give you a chance to look at this thing called leadership. And, uh, you know, my commitment is that you discover something tonight, that you discover something, wow, I hadn't seen that before. And that something make a difference for you this fall quarter. Because as we will, we will say here in a moment, leadership begins with leading oneself, right? And many of you are just saying, look, I'm just trying to get through the first year of med school, or I'm just going to do my first year of my MBA. I don't want to lead anyone yet. But, you know, all of us are leaders in training. UCLA, we want to graduate you out into the world to make a big difference. So tonight is a little jump start. That's our intention. And uh, to quote our famous coach, John Wooden, failure to prepare is preparing to fail. So, um, you know, you're taking advantage of an optional evening tonight, and we're going to make it worth your while. We're going to have fun. You're going to have three different breakouts with a randomized group of people from across campus. So, uh, it's not just going to be talking heads the whole time. We're going to keep it interactive. We're going to have some um, interactions between Dr. Cooper and myself and some of you who raise your hand. And uh, at the end of the evening, you're going to discover something you haven't seen about yourself. And you're going to have a little pep in your step, a little something extra going through the rest of the summer, getting ready to go into, into the start of your graduate journey. So one of my favorite quotes is the old African proverb of it takes a village to raise a child. And what we like to say at Anderson is it takes a village to raise an MBA. Uh, I work with the fully employed MBA cohort of people, people who are kind of junior executive MBAs. They have full-time jobs, you know, husbands, wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, not plural of all those, but, you know, representing all those categories. They're people with big lives. They have careers and they go to graduate school at UCLA and, um, and they get the degree and they, they go out and they make a difference in the world in, in corporate America, which is, you know, part of the mix. So drawing from that metaphor, um, tonight is also generated by a village. And I want to introduce some of the members of the village who are able to be here tonight. Um, so this is, this is our committee. We are a small but mighty interdisciplinary committee across campus. And uh, we're just going to kind of go from top right to bottom left and, um, you know, just let you hear from some of, of the representation of the eight different graduate programs that are that are here with us tonight. So, Elisa Lopez, would you be so kind as to as to start us out? Yes, thank you so much, Dylan, and welcome everyone. We are delighted that you can join us here this evening. We want to welcome you to UCLA. Um, I am the Executive Director of Admissions at the David Geffen School of Medicine, so a special welcome to all of our medical students who are here with us this evening. And just wanted to mention that leadership is a part of every graduate program at UCLA. Being a graduate student uh, is truly being a leader, so this is a powerful way to start your program. So welcome again here this evening. Thank you, Alisa. And because we like Alisa, it's such a beautiful name. Alisa. 
thanks, Dylan. I wanna welcome everyone to this wonderful um, workshop this evening. And I will keep my intro short and sweet since there's um, many of us that wanna welcome you. And I am the executive director of the Master of Financial Engineering program at Anderson School of Management. And so I would like to give a special welcome to those of you from our program incoming from all across the world, actually a lot of international students for joining um, on this really special occasion. So thank you, Dylan and, um, and Kush. Thanks, Elisa. Anna is unable to be with us from dentistry tonight. So we'll move along with Liz Izquierdo from nursing. Thank you, Dylan. Good evening, everyone. Um, like Dylan mentioned, my name is Liz Izquierdo, Associate Dean for Student Services at the UCLA School of Nursing. A very special welcome to our PhD, our MECN, our APRN, and if our undergrads are there, welcome. It's so great to see everybody. This is just one of the few times um, that I have been involved in that there's been such a, a a community coming together of graduate and professional students. And um, I've been part of the privilege to be part of that for the last few years. So just wanna let you know what a special evening this is um, and what a wonderful opportunity to meet your colleagues across campus. So I hope you enjoy this evening. A very thank you to Dylan and all the people across Kush who you'll meet shortly for organizing this meeting for us. Well, we are thrilled to be here with you. And it takes a village. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. And thanks for your leadership. Liz has been on the committee uh, quite actively the last couple of years, and we appreciate that very much. Uh, Julian. Hi, everyone. Welcome to UCLA, and congratulations again. Uh, and thank you so much for taking some time out of your summer to be with us. Uh, my name is Julian Jose Chen. I'm the Assistant Dean for Student Services at the Fielding School of Public Health. So uh, another welcome to our MPH, MS, and PhD public health students. Um, and I just want to echo everything that everyone has already said. Uh, I'm just already inspired by the, my colleagues, and I'm sure you'll have opportunities to be inspired by each other, even if you're in different programs. So, so thank you again, and welcome. Thanks, Dylan. Thanks, Julian. Mark. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Hoven. I'm the Director of Recruitment, Outreach, and Admission here in the UCLA School of Nursing and just want to welcome everyone. Uh, this is going to be a wonderful event, um, but at the same time, I'm also looking forward to seeing everyone's faces, hopefully in the new future. Uh, but again, welcome and congratulations. Thank you, Mark. Um, Oliver listed next from uh, Social Welfare uh, sends his regrets. He's also unable to be here tonight, uh, but we appreciate both Anna and, and Oliver for their contributions. And Shannon Bell. Yes, I'll bring it home. Um, my name is Shannon Bell. I'm the executive director of the EMBA admissions pro team here with the executive MBA program at Anderson. Um, you know, I was just saying before everyone got on that this is what is really special about UCLA. It's truly you're, you're joining a community, a campus experience. Um, this is really unique as, as um, Liz mentioned, but I see in the six years I've been here, I see more and more opportunities for this. So I encourage you, if you're showing up today, you're someone who wants to network across campus, make that effort, you can. Sometimes you just have to take the initiative. So um, you're taking the initiative today and congrats on that. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention, uh, you might notice a lot of you look like you have the name um, Bradley Blackburn. So if you, I, there might have been something with the EMBA because that is a new EMBA student. So if everyone can just make sure your name is, especially as you go into breakout rooms, your name is the correct name being shown. If you're not familiar with um, Zoom, there's three little kind of dots that are in the upper right hand corner of your picture. And that's where you can rename yourself if currently the correct name is not listed. So um, welcome everyone and have fun tonight. Thank you, Shannon. So yes, so thanks from, and of course, all of us on the various teams have additional people in the background, but on behalf of each of the, the groups, thanks everyone for, for being on the committee and, and for inviting your students and yeah, just having this, this evening be possible. Couple, a couple more thank yous because it takes a big village. Our patron, a couple friends, and our presenters tonight. So Gonzalo Fracius, those of you in executive MBA, fully employed MBA, 
Um, Gonzalo Frasch is, is the, the, the leader to whom Shannon and I have both report with from EMBA and FEMBA. I've worked for Gonzalo for almost two decades. He's a wonderful human being. He sends his very best tonight. It's his anniversary and his wife got him tickets to the all-star game. And he was really, he was like feeling guilty about it. I'm like, Hey, happy wife, happy life. So he is, he is um, over at Dodger stadium, but um, he's a, a full support of this endeavor and um, actually supported me to take Kusha's Dr. Cooper's course back in 2016 over at, at Luskin in the School of Social Welfare. And, and that really started my journey to now being a person training to teach the course. So my appreciation to Gonzalo. Sarika Thacker was a member of our committee the last two years, was um, here with us in the executive MBA program. She's still kind of member at large and is chief of staff for education information studies. Erin Wimberly is on uh, my team, um, I'm not sure if Aaron, do you want to say hi or those of you admitted to FEMBA know Aaron, she runs the, um, uh, the you know, all your transcripts cross Aaron's desk and get verified and certified before they go to graduate division for your official notification. And Aaron um, is a graduate of Dr. Cooper's course. So last chance, Aaron, anything you want to say? Just welcome to all of the FEMBAs. Thank you for all of your hard work. I know that it's more than a notion to get all those things together. And I'm um, looking forward to spending some time with you today at Palooza and uh, Leadership Foundations too. Ooh, and Aaron just dropped a little seed. At the end of tonight, everybody's gonna get a big invitation to a little Saturday soiree we're having. If you're out of the country, don't worry about it. But if you happen to be around at the end of tonight, everybody's gonna get an invitation to a little um, soiree that Anderson hosts called Palooza. So we'll, we'll end the evening with a link to that if you would like to participate, we'd love to have you. So now I'd like to introduce um, a real a person that I hold in high esteem. Dr. Kush Cooper is, um, is the professor of record for this course that we're gonna, we're gonna pull from tonight. And we've kind of built this leadership lab around the content of her course. Um, Kush is an adjunct professor of social welfare in the Luskin School of Public Affairs. She focuses on policy, leadership and macro practice, which is you know, policy, policy and implementation. She is a sought after consultant to uh, the public child welfare systems. She is a subject matter advisor to foster care with the UCLA Williams Institute, which is a nationally renowned LGBT policy center, LGBTQ policy center. And uh, I had the honor of taking Kush's course back in 2016 we became kind of work colleagues. We started to have coffee once a month and uh, with another professor, Dr. Amy Waterman from, um, from UCLA Health, the three of us hosted two faculty summits in 2018 and 2019 to um, offer this course, being a leader in the effective exercise of leadership to faculty from six continents around the world. We had four faculty from Kenya fly 36 hours to be at UCLA to take the course. So, um, uh, it's just it's just an honor. I, I really respect uh, Dr. Cooper quite a lot. Kush, would you like to say hi? I would love to say hi. Hello, everyone. Welcome. So great to be with you and so great to share some material that's made a huge difference in my life, as you can hear in Dylan's life and and, and you know hundreds of folks that have that have that have taken the course. So just welcome. Sit back. No need to take notes. As Dylan said, we're gonna discover for ourselves and what you discover for yourself, you need no notes to remember. Thank you, Kush. Thank you for your uh, leadership in this, in this fun journey, this fun experiment we've been doing with this kind of cross-campus partnership. So, um, Pleasure. I, oh, my, and lastly, I'm Dylan Stafford. Um, I'll be 20 years at UCLA next August. I'm from the South, so you'll hear a twang now and again. I have an MBA from the University of Chicago, spent six and a half years with a German company, Siemens, uh, got to be in San Jose, got to be in Germany for three years, had wonderful post MBA outcomes, and then got laid off after 9-11 and followed my fiance, who's now my forever wife, to um, Los Angeles in 2002 and got a little foot in the door job at UCLA Anderson. And then a year in, I was promoted to director of admissions and a decade in, I became the dean of admissions I've written two books since I've been here. And uh, since I did Kush's course in 2016, I launched a podcast. I wrote my second book. Um, but I'm a big, I'm kind of a happy accidental Bruin super fan. 
You know, I went to Texas A&M undergrad, so I knew about Baylor Bears and Rice Owls and, you know, SMU Mustangs, but I didn't know anything about the California schools. And I got out here and I'm like, oh, yeah, so tell me, how does it work? Well, USC is our enemy. I'm like, oh, okay, good. And, you know, all that kind of silly stuff. And um, working at UCLA is an honor. I'll just end with this real quickly. I am a super fan of this institution. Um, you know, we invented the internet. The very first ping of what is today the internet went from UCLA to Stanford, if you know that story, Dr. Kleinrock. He intended to, he, what he was trying to type was lo and behold. That was the phrase they tri tried to send and it cut off after lo. <laughs> that was the very first ping of the internet. It left Westwood and, and went up to Stanford. I don't know if you know this, uh, Ralph Bunch, the, the fifth valedictorian, UCLA was founded in 1919. Class of 2023, 20, five years in, the fifth class valedictorian was an African-American man who went on to become the first African-American to win the Nobel Peace Prize, right? UCLA has been making history its entire 103 years of existence. And the more you learn about UCLA, the more proud you will become of this institution. It really is one of the most recognized university brands in the world. And the impacts in science, the impacts in art, in mathematics, in the humanities, um, in all of the disciplines represented here this evening, medicine and health and social welfare and management. So, uh, you know, you're, you're part of something really special. 540,000 alumni around the world have graduated from UCLA. We're the fifth largest alumni network of any American university. So you're part of something global. You're part of something significant. You're part of something impactful. And, um, you know, tonight we're just going to kind of jumpstart. We're going to give you a little bit of little extra energy. So thank you all for trusting us with an evening, as was said, a beautiful summer evening. So thanks for being here. And I know some of you are logging in from other countries, et cetera. So, so with no further ado, let us begin. So here's what we're going to cover tonight. Uh, three main topics. Each of these topics will have a breakout. Like I said, you're going to be with a randomized group of people, and you're going to be with the same group for all three breakouts. So you're going to get a chance to talk to each other, meet the first time, and then talk a little deeper the second time. And by the third time, we're going to get the conversation pretty, pretty rich. So um, the, this first little section, we're going to talk about leadership begins with leading yourself, the power of context. Uh, then we're going to go to a breakout. We're going to come back, see what you saw. Then we're going to talk, uh, Dr. Cooper's going to take over from there. Kush is going to take over and lead the middle. What makes extraordinary leaders extraordinary, which is a deeper look at the power of context. Have a second breakout, come back, see what you saw. And then we're going to, we're going to talk about two of the four foundational factors for being a leader. Uh, the four foundational factors are integrity, authenticity, being given being by something bigger than oneself and being caused in the matter. Um, we're going to introduce integrity and authenticity tonight, and then you'll have a third breakout. We'll come back, see what we saw. We're going to end the night with some thank yous, give you an invitation to Palooza on the weekend. And, uh, you know, we, we might go to 830. We might, we might get done early, but we will definitely not go longer than 830 California time. All right. So the material, as I said, just to uh, provide academic homage where it is due, the material that we're drawing from tonight is from uh, Kush's course, uh, Social Welfare 270, Being a Leader in the Effective Exercise of Leadership, an ontological, phenomenological model. And um, the course has a slide deck textbook. It's about a thousand page PowerPoint deck. And the authors of that, the original authors of the work, Warner Earhart, Dr. Michael Jensen, Steve Zafron, Dr. Jerry Echevarria. So everything that the academic component of tonight we are, we are drawing from, from Kush's course. And just a quick note on those two $50 words. You used to say 50 cent, but now with inflation, you gotta say $50. So ontological is, is about being, you know? We're all human beings. What is that being when we have those two words together? And um, phenomenological is, is the study of, of phenomena. What can you see? If you have a video camera on the wall or a fly on the wall, that is looking at a situation, what is happening? So um, this course is a discovery into what is it to be a leader? Was it, what is it to exercise leadership effectively as your natural self-expression? That's the promise of the course. And tonight we're gonna, we're gonna talk about context. We're gonna look at context and we're gonna look at integrity and authenticity. And in these breakouts and in your own reflection as, you, as you're here tonight, be looking, you know, what kind of leader am I right here? 
July 19th, 2022, a few weeks, a, a month and a half out from the launch of my graduate journey. You know, what's he talking about? Being a leader, I, I just want to survive grad school. Well, here's the thing. You're smart enough to get admitted. You're hardworking. You're going to survive grad school. We don't want you to survive. You know, we want you to thrive. We want you to graduate and go make a difference in the world in your chosen fields. So that's what we're all about tonight is, is getting some wind beneath your wings to get you launched, that you have the best fall quarter you can possibly imagine this, this fall quarter. So how to listen tonight. Here's how to listen tonight. Here's how to get maximum value from tonight. Like Dr. Cooper, like, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, I'll quit saying Dr. Cooper. Like Kush said, um, don't worry about remembering everything. This is a workshop, not a class. You're not gonna be graded on this material. Listen tonight with, with beginner's mind, with curiosity. Oh, oh, huh, huh. Be willing to look, be willing to discover. If you use, you know, when you go to the store, the clothing store, try things on like a, like a loose jacket. You know, when you stand at the three-way mirror <laughs> and you, you check the cut, I, I am, I'm at home, but I am wearing a full suit. I even have on leather shoes and dress socks. I did the whole thing for you all. So crazy, this Zoom life. But when you try on clothes and you're looking at yourself in the three-way mirror, you have that jacket. You know, what's the cut? What's the color? What's the shape? Does, does that jacket, do I stand up straight in that jacket? Does that jacket call for me to really go out into the world with some confidence? right? Try on tonight. Try it on like a jacket. Huh, what's he talking about? You know, some of you have military expertise. You may hear some things tonight that are different from how you've been trained to be a leader. It's great. Just try it on. During your graduate study at UCLA, you'll have many, many opportunities to be introduced to the breadth of what there is out there. Tonight, we're talking about leadership for you. And it's not the truth. It's not the only model but try it on. Wow, if I took on integrity, if I took on being authentic, what might be available to me? Where might that make a difference? Where might that forward the game I'm up to in life? Okay, so don't believe anything we're saying tonight. It's not the one and only. It's a model, but it's a very powerful model that's designed to provide access to the being of being a leader. And that's part of what's going to be your journey as you go through grad school. You will become a person with a voice. You'll have something to say and you'll want to say it and you'll want to be heard. And leadership is about using language to create futures that weren't going to happen otherwise. And that's what we're interested in at UCLA, that you go make a future for this planet that wasn't going to happen otherwise. So that's a little bit about how to listen tonight. So leadership begins with leading yourself. We've said that a couple of times, repetition. Why are we saying that over and over? What's he pointing at? Leadership begins with leading yourself. If you cannot lead yourself, you cannot lead others. Leading begins with an effective exercise of leadership in leading yourself. Who do I have to get out of bed every single morning? Me. I'm a parent. I have two children. I'm responsible for them as a parent, but what am I? What am I aiming them towards? What do I want them to do when they go out in the world? I want them to be able to get themselves motivated, to listen for where they can fit into society. What call might they heed as they choose their discipline, their field, the way you all have chosen your disciplines, your field? So we start with leading ourselves, then we become equipped to lead others. So that's a quote from our course. And to keep this UCLA centric, Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Here's another thing you need to know about UCLA as you become very, very proud of your future alma mater. Coach John Wooden is a living legend. Well, not, excuse me. He's a legend in the world of coaching. One of the most winning coaches ever to coach the sport of basketball or any sport for that matter. Uh, he took UCLA to 10 national championships, including seven in a row. And after he retired, then he got busy teaching about leadership and his pyramid of success is still one of the most influential leadership tomes in the world of, of sports and his, his coaching legacy among professional and college basketball coaches is immense. So 
we want you to win this quarter, right? We want you to win. And that's what tonight's about. So we're talking about context. You heard me say that. A created context. So this is who you all are to us, the committee, Kush, myself. This is not the truth. We just created this because it's inspiring. You are the future of your fields. You are the future of the fields of medicine, nursing, health, social welfare, management, financial engineering. The next time a pandemic rolls around, you are the ones who are going to lead it. And as we saw from this pandemic we're just coming out of, we needed medicine. We needed frontline staff. We needed nurses. We needed healthcare professionals. We needed social welfare. We needed people to help keep, keep the thing going forward. We needed management. We needed all of it. The pandemic was bigger than any one field. So you're the future of your fields. You're also the future of UCLA. We who have admissions roles on the committee, we chose you with great care. And we're excited to watch you unfold as you go through your graduate journey. You're our legacy. And all of us as people, just as people, not as officers of the school, you're the future of this country. You're the future of this world. We're all trusting you to run the world that our children inherit and take care of us when we're old. So that's a created context. And part of tonight, what you're going to discover is what's, he, what's a created context? And Kush is going to go really deep into that. And we're going to invite you to create a context for yourself bigger than the context you have walking in here tonight. What we want for you, i.e., why Leadership Lab? Why are they doing this? We want you to have the best academic term ever this fall quarter. And some of you are like, this guy doesn't know. I have a 3.95 in undergrad and my MCATs were way up here. I got this handled. And I respect that. And I really do respect that. But I've been a dean at Anderson for a decade. And I do academic probation counseling. And our, our little part-time program, we're one of the top five programs in the nation since the history of rankings. And when I do academic probation counseling, it's never a question of whether the person is smart enough. They have high GMATs and high GPAs, but graduate school is a different animal. It goes very quickly. And in medicine, in nursing, in health and social welfare, some of you in the, in the PhD programs, all of you in the Anderson School. So, I want tonight to empower you, and that's what we're going to end with, with the third breakout, to really look for actionable things that you could aim at to get yourself ready for what I call having a flat tire. You know, a lot of times when I do academic probation counseling with people, it, it, they were not an admissions mistake. That's not what's going on. It's, oh, I tore my rotator cuff and I can't get the surgery for another month. And I'm, 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 I'm impacted, I've lost mobility. Or, oh my gosh, our family is expanding. There's a pregnancy that um, is happening and we're dealing with that. Or like, a, what's a good problem? This happens sometimes, my boss quit. I just got a battlefield promotion. I just got a promotion. Oh my goodness. How am I gonna handle the extra 20 hours a week I gotta give to my career, plus the 20, 25 hours a week, my part-time MBA requires, right? So I said earlier, it takes a village to raise a graduate student. So we're going to talk tonight about your village. Who are the people you call when you're having a bad day? Might be your mom, your father, your sister, your brother, your best girlfriend, your best boyfriend, right? Who are your, who are your people? Who are your go-to first circle, circle of support? Like, do they know why you're going to go to UCLA? Have you actually told them what you're excited about. We're going to talk about authenticity tonight. And you're going to get a chance to discover like, oh my God, I haven't even bothered to tell mom why I'm doing this. I just assume she knows. Okay. So that's what we want for you. As successful as you are, as amazing as you are, we want you to take all of that that earned your seat here at UCLA. And we want to pivot that into an incredible fall quarter that you start your graduate school on the very best foot possible. So that's what we're committed to tonight. So 
All right, six o'clock. Oh my God, hit my first time mark. I am so happy. So we're gonna now do a breakout. Aaron, give you a minute's notice or so while I set this up. Um, you're gonna be sent to a random group, five people in a group of people. You know, you may have a couple of people from your program. There might be two medical doctors. There might be three, you know, it's random and we don't know who you are. We didn't ask you to identify yourself. So Aaron is setting up the groups. And um, we're going to use this, this part in red. These are the instructions. We're going to ask you to go alphabetically. I'm going to give you the two prompts. But in terms of the sequence, look at, you know, whoever's name, Alyssa with a Y goes before, excuse me, goes after Alyssa with a I, right? So alphabetical by first name. The first person is also the timer. This is a big part of getting an MBA is learning how to be the timer in a group. <laughs> I don't know how important it is in medicine, but you're always in groups when you're getting a, an Anderson degree. So the first person is also the timer. So it will have 10 minutes for this breakout and you know, take about two minutes each. Okay, so if you're a person who's a tiny bit shy, this is an opportunity. You know, two minutes may seem like an eternity, but this is a safe space, right? You are with amazing people and you're amazing too. So don't let imposter syndrome, none of that. None of that. You can notice it, discover it's happening, and then set it to the side, right? And take about two minutes and share your name. Which program are you in? And why are you choosing graduate school at UCLA? Tell people, you know, why you, everybody who's admitted to UCLA got admitted somewhere else normally. Because if you're qualified for UCLA, you're definitely qualified for some other schools. And you chose UCLA. So that's the first half prompt. And then the second one, and this is going to lead into Kusha's section next, share an example of an extraordinary leader, someone you respect. It could be a public person. It could be a private person that only you know about. But look, who's somebody that's a leader that I look up to? I mean, extraordinary. They inspire me. And what is it about them that you see that is extraordinary? Okay. So those are the two prompts. If you want to take a screenshot, you can do that. I know you think you're going to remember it, but you won't. Okay. Name, program, why you're choosing graduate school. So introduce yourself. You can say your undergrad, anything like that. You know, just let people know something about you. And, you know, somebody who's an extraordinary leader that I respect is, and then say, and say what it is about them that you respect. Okay. So two minutes each, five people in a group. Uh, we'll give you a, you know, a couple minute prompt towards the end, but self self pace with the person with the alphabetical first name. That's the start of the alphabet going first and also being the timer. Any questions before we send you to breakouts? All right, Aaron, are we ready? We are ready. So breakout rooms are open. If you don't see a prompt pop up on your screen, uh, please just navigate down to the three dots on your Zoom window, press breakout rooms, and you should be able to join from there. Rooms are open. Thank you, Erin. Yep, thank you. I'll be back now. All right, welcome back, welcome back. How about those people? Aren't they amazing? Isn't that kind of interesting? Like, wow, there are a lot of cool people going to UCLA. I hope that was your experience. That is always my experience when I get to meet people from across campus. So um, I'd love now to have a little audience interaction. You know, what did you see in your breakout? You know, like leaders have eyes and leaders see different things that many people miss, right? So I'm curious, like what you might've discovered. Very simple, 15 minutes, actually 12 minutes. Random group of people, kind of exciting, kind of nervous, right? So the prompts were, why are you choosing to go to graduate school at UCLA? And who are some of the extraordinary leaders you shared? So I'd love, uh, just you know, raise your digital hand. It'll bring you, because I can't see all the screens at once. But I'd love to hear from a couple people. You know, What did you discover? It could be the prompt specifically for yourself, what you heard in your peers. All right, and and you know we'll let the networking continue. So um, we'll start with Sid, but you know Sid, go ahead and say which program you're in. You know a couple things about yourself, and then what did you see in your breakout? 
Sure. Uh, hey, Dylan. Um, so this is uh, Sid Iyer. Uh, I'm in Fembo class of 2025. Um, really excited to meet all of you here and, of course, at Palooza on the weekend. Um, I think the thing that really stood out to me when I was meeting the people in my breakout room was just the fact that the, pe the leaders that people chose were not only just like interesting and have like, you know, very awesome and cool backstories, but they were very like personal choices. There were people that chose family members like mothers and fathers, but also people that they work with and people that like they look up to in their industries, which I thought was interesting because obviously you expect people to go with sort of like these larger than life characters we see on TV and so forth. So I thought that was really cool to have like really unique uh, people sort of talked about in, you know, in our discussions. So that was really cool. Thank you. So, you know, so personal examples, not just the, the automatic larger than life examples. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, what about for yourself? You know, why did, why did you choose UCLA? So uh, I chose UCLA. So I'm, I guess just to one step back, I'm a software engineer at IBM and I work in uh, IBM's Los Angeles office. Um, so UCLA was a logical choice from a geographical perspective. Um, but I think more than that, the thing that really interested me out of all the schools that are in Southern California was I'm particularly interested in the technology management, but also the entertainment management concentrations. Um, obviously having a tech background at IBM, that one sort of makes sense. But, um, you know, when I'm not working, I have a bit of like, you know, uh, involvement in the entertainment industry. So sort of the combination of the two, I'm really curious to see how I can sort of meld those two, um, you know, areas together and see where that can take me. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Sid. Thanks for going first. I appreciate that. Sure. Um, how about Hitesh, if I may be pronouncing that not correctly? No, you got it spot on. All right. You got it spot on. Sorry. Yeah. So what I noticed, I guess the question is, what did I notice in the breakout room? Yeah. What did you see? You know, just just the whole thing, right? It's you, yeah. Graduate, graduate school is going to put you in some experiences you've not been in before. And that was just one. You know, what did you see? Yeah. 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 I definitely saw a lot of um, a lot of interesting faces. We were about five or six of us and uh, obviously unprepared. A uh, few of us were not really prepared for what to do or what to say. But, you know, a smile on the face and, and a little bit of confidence can can really become contagious. And that's what I saw. That's what I experienced. I had some on mine and I had uh, Bradley on uh, Bradley Blackburn, who wasn't Bradley Blackburn, but I I, it was Becky and we basically just kind of started uh, smiling and laughing and then within like 30 seconds or less everybody was like hey great to be here and let's do this and so yeah like I said we're all winging it is my take a little bit of smile and a little bit of confidence can get contagious and that's how I think the world can become a better place especially your um, EMBA or FEMBA whichever you know journey you're on to that could be uh, becoming a that could become a much better experience with just those two qualities. I feel. Thank you, Hitesh. Yeah. So, you know, haven't ever been here before, and hey, a little bit of smile, a little bit of encouragement, confidence is is a contagious thing, and 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 here we go. You know, none of us really know what we're doing, right? Don't you know? I love imposter syndrome, right? It's a fascinating psychological thing. Anytime we take a stair step in life. You know, high school to college, college to graduate school, single to committed, committed to really committed, you know, committed with no children, committed with children. We're never ready for those stair steps, right? We all feel like imposters from time to time. And as a leader in my life, if I take the time to start leading myself and I actually go into a new situation, you know, am I nervous? Let's do a little self check. What's going on with me internally? Oh, butterflies you know, a little, little bit heightened awareness, right? Okay, great. Is it possible that might be happening for others also? You know, maybe a leader sees how it's going for other people and a leader, instead of getting lost in their own, starts to look out here and make a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of, hey, what's your name? Hi, how you doing? You know, get over there where they are and, and pull them and and all of a sudden, you know, there's that reciprocity happening. So great, great example, Hitesh. Thank you for sharing that. 
All right, we'll we'll hear from from Ryan and then from Bucky. Ryan. Hey Dylan, good good to see you. Um, my name is Ryan for, for the group. My name is Ryan. I'm a um, an incoming student in the Themba program at Anderson. Um, I would just comment. I, I think Sid made some great points to to start and some similar things where he was mentioning uh, familial and personal choices for um, leaders. We had some of those in our group, but one of the other things that stood out to me um, was there was a, a commonality of uh, those of us who didn't pick uh, personal leaders were the CEOs or supervisors who really cared about employees and cared about mentorship. That was a, that was a theme. Um, and it was really interesting because uh, it seemed to be even less of an emphasis of like, oh, this person has really great, uh, you know, managerial skills or is really technically sound. It was, you know, who are the people that really uh, focus on uh, caring for employees and, and, and growth, like having a growth mindset from a mentorship point of view. Um, so that was an interesting discussion. I, I appreciated that, that viewpoint from, from my peers. Thanks, Ryan. And, and just like Sid, welcome to FEMBA and Hitesh and everyone, welcome to UCLA. But, you know, you're personal to me because <laughs> I've had a chance to have some one-on-ones with you, Ryan. So you observed, you discovered, you saw that some of the examples, you know, similar as was said earlier, not necessarily the big mountaintop unattainable, but, but more like people in an organization who take the time to bring up junior staff, people who yeah. pay it forward, people who reach back and pull people up with them. That, that there, was a, there was a couple of occasions of that being the examples people shared. Did I hear that accurately? Yeah, yeah precisely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't that interesting? Like, you know, you could choose from anything and you choose an example of someone who was of service to others. Yeah, and, and that was what was, uh, it was great to think about that. And, and the last thing I would mention just on a first level, like I gave an example of, of my mother who's a city manager for my hometown. And of course that's like a very personal connection, but I also, it also stood out to me the work she does on like a managerial level and working with her department heads and, and like the story she tells of how she wants to be a leader that you know her employees think of as like, I'm a really great leader because of the person I am, not necessarily because of, you know, X, Y, Z, KPIs, you know, stuff like that. So I, I think that's, uh, it's, it's a fun perspective to, to think about. Yeah, and not only that, but she raised you. So she must be a heck of a woman. Yeah. Isn't so that, that great, Dylan, that, 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 that folks are already seeing that perhaps leadership is not about authority or not about a title or a position. Perhaps it's an activity or a practice um, that, that anyone, your, your, your family members, your loved ones uh, can participate in. Even you can, right? It's not, leadership's not over there. There's not, you're, you're ready now. Right? There's, there's nowhere to get. You can lead from where you are. And you're, and, and you're all mentioning, mentioning instances of folks that lead from where they are. Yeah, really great. And then I have a, I have a request. Yes. If you have raised your hand and you're asking a question, keep your hand raised while we're interacting because otherwise you disappear from my screen and I can't see you because there's 145 of you. So it's like, you're there and then you're gone. So don't lower it till we're, till the, till the interaction's complete. Thank you. All right. And um, I, again, I'm, if I pronounce poorly, please correct me. Uh, Bucky, is that? It's Buki. Buki, I was thinking Buki. I was gonna miss it. Okay, Buki. That's no problem. Very nice to meet Hi, you. Hi everybody. Good to meet you too, Dylan. Um, the folks in my group, um, even though some of us chose- um, Please, excuse me, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but please, uh, which program are you in, if you don't mind? I'm in the FEMBA program. Excellent, thank you, sorry. Yeah, and I was happy <laughs> Some to other meet people you. can share too, but I wanted to, okay. Thank totally. You. Um, I was happy to meet one of my classmates in my group. So if anybody is in the Tuesday, Thursday section, me and Linda will be there. Um, so a lot of um, what we, what we discussed, it was not necessarily the lofty things that the leaders that we chose have done in the world, but we talked more about, and this is directly to Kush's point, 
um, who they're being in the world and the type of person that they are and how they deal with the outside world. So um, one person mentioned Barack Obama, not necessarily for his endless accomplishments, but because of how he deals with things under pressure, under pressure and makes people feel comfortable. Um, we also talked a little bit about mentorship, which um, was mentioned earlier, um, that we admire people who uh, take the time to pull others up, to mentor, to teach, to lead um, when it's not necessarily asked of them. Um, so those are the couple of things that I took away from my, um, from my group. And that I found that all the leaders that we chose had in common. Thank you, Buki. Yeah, isn't that interesting? So now we've had a little representation from a couple different groups and there's a little bit of a theme arising. Even someone as renowned as Barack Obama it's not just the endless list of accomplishments, but it's, you know, how does he leave people? How does he, how do people feel when they interact with him? And then, and then it gets really personal. Who, who in my own experience of living, you know, leaves me empowered? And where do I leave others empowered? Leaders pay attention to stuff like this. And, and Kush has already alluded to, and you can maybe start to, think where the next section is going to start to look. You know, it, it's not about always title, position, and authority. Anybody ever know someone with a big title who was obviously not a leader? I know in my experience at Siemens, I've seen that. I've never seen that at UCLA, of course, but, it, but in other organizations, right? At Siemens, they had something called the Elephant Graveyard, and it was, uh, it was Wittelsbacher Platz. It was an old castle in downtown Munich. And it was full, it was like, they called it the elephant graveyard. It was full of vice presidents. You know, in Germany, they have a different kind of idea about lifetime employment. And these were people who were vice presidents and they had no one who accounted, no one who reported to them anymore. And they all lived at the elephant graveyard and they just would, they had offices and they would go in and they would just sit there, <laughs> you know? They had a title but they were no longer active. They were just kind of riding out the end of their career. So what if leadership is something I can exercise now? You know, right where I am right here, right now. Okay, thank you, Buki, Ryan, Hitesh, Sid. Now we're gonna, we're gonna proceed forward and in a little while we'll have another breakout, 30, 40 minutes. And when we come back from that one, I do invite, I want to hear from medicine, I want to hear from social welfare, I want to hear from health, I want to hear from financial engineering, okay? I'm not trying to play favorites, I just called on people who raised their hands. So uh, we, want to, we want to hear from all of us tonight. And um, I am now going to turn on sharing screen again and go back to the slide deck. And... Um, and Kush, would you like to take the conversation from here? I would be delighted. You know, I want to I, I want to underline something that I that I just heard um, in in this last interaction. Um, you know, we can we can make this about we could make it about feelings, right? We could make it about well, you know, how 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 do I leave people? How how do people leave me? Um, but I want to key in on what you said, Dylan, about the word empowerment. Empowerment isn't a nice thing to do, maybe. Um, think about a, a big co-created future, like Dylan mentioned, that wasn't going to happen anyway in this prevailing context. We are fooling ourselves if we think that we're going to get there on our own, on our own power. And so to the degree that you can be empowered and empower others, the likelihood of you all together making good on that future that God created goes up. And, and it's, it's a, you know, it's not a, 
this is not about being nice. This is about being up to big things uh, and being up to, to creating a possibility for another uh, that shows them that, that there's a future to which they can make a noteworthy contribution. And, and you know, there's the, that, that, that last interaction just couldn't have highlighted that better. So I just wanted to make sure, make sure to highlight that. All right, so back to our question. Um, and it, it was a bit of a trick question. Um, and I'm gonna pull the rug out a little from under you, but but let's let's ask it again. So, what makes an extraordinary leader extraordinary? Or asked another way, what makes extraordinary leaders be extraordinary? Okay, what is it? So, there's two ways to answer this question. All right. Um, and and as we as we embark on on the answer to that the two ways to answer that question, I want you to consider that knowing how to be a leader is not the same thing as being a leader. Right? Knowing how knowing medicine is not the same thing as being a doctor. Okay. Knowing and being are distinct. So we're going to take that into our, and my notes are over here. So when my eyes move, that's what's happening is I'm going to my notes over here. We scholars, um, you know, and I am guilty of this as, as, as many of, of us in academia are, we are taught to, um, rewarded for, uh, and promoted for, taking an epistemological approach to the topics we cover. So that's conveying knowledge about the topics we cover. Um, and we assume that describing something impacts our students' being. It doesn't. An epistemological mastery leaves someone knowing about something. Right? If I give you knowledge, you know it and understand it, but that's where that ends. An ontological mastery of a subject leaves one being. This is why Dylan mentioned the ontological phenomenological model to provide access to creating leaders. We wanna employ an ontological perspective and a phenomenological methodology so we can evoke what it means to be a leader and exercise leadership effectively um, in, in the folks we're, we're in conversation with, okay? So knowing distinct from being. So let's take that a step further. I'm gonna introduce two distinctions to you that we use in the course. Go ahead, next slide, Dylan. So, in the stands and on the court. They're related to the last slide in that there's two ways you can go through life. And by the way, none, not one is better than the other. I just assert that we've been weighted towards an epistemological mastery in academia, right? And particularly in the area of leadership, that's not enough. If you're a tennis player, you should watch film of yourself. Right, And you should know the rules of tennis, but that's not on the court playing tennis, right? So there's two ways of going through life. One way is in the stands, right? Standing back, observing what's going on in life versus on the court or actually being in the action of life. So we can access or research leadership or teach it. You can just, you can go through, get the whole thing up there, Dylan. So in the stands, and any of you, and let's, let's, let's hear from somebody in the audience. Who's recently 
been to a sports event and would like to interact with me? Who's recently been to a sports event? Just raise your digital hand so we'll see you. Jay. Hi, Jay. So tell me about the event. Tell me about the event. I went to a Dodger game. Okay. And you and you were you were in the stands. Correct. I, I okay. So tell me what what was happening? Like what was happening in the stands? What were what were people doing? What were you hearing? <laughs> Where I was sitting, there were a lot of drunk fans. So I was hearing a okay. lot of fans. A lot of alcohol, okay. <laughs> uh I heard a dad explaining the rules to his son. Okay, um, explanation. Good. I heard people cheering when the Dodgers were playing well. I heard people boo the umpire. Exactly. Exactly. So you heard explanation. You heard commentary. Right. You heard um, description, right? And that is what this, that, that's what happens in the stands, right? Um, be in an action are observed, commented on. Um, it's a third person approach. Right? And you can know a lot, like the, like the dad that was explaining the rules, the dad may know a lot about the rules, right? But that's not the court, right? That's distinct. Have you ever played a sport? Yes. Okay, so now what was the sport? Water polo. Okay, water polo. And, and, and you, where'd you go? You lowered your hand, come back. Oh, sorry, it went there down. There you go, see that's what happened. You, you're gone. Um, when you're playing water polo, right? You're, well, in the pool or on the court, so to speak, what's that like? What do you hear? What do you see? Um, you hear a lot of yelling, a lot of whistles, and... Um, what are people yelling? Switch, pass, shoot, defense. Yeah, it's action. Right? Mm -hmm. What you hear is language that, that evokes action. It's nothing like being in the stands. Now, if you're yelling at the ref, you may think you're in the game and that's influencing something, but it's not. So thank you, Jay. Um, but that sort of illustrates, right? That's, that's the distinction between going through life in the stands and going through life on the court. Leadership happens on the court. And so our access to leadership on the court is actually as lived real time first person, right? And it leaves you being. Right, so I want to get those two. So you've got now, you've got knowing and being, you've got in the stands and on the court. Any questions about that before I move on? Any yeah, buts, how about what ifs? And I, Franklin. Hi, hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, just for, you mentioned, um, Sports event that you've been to, but I've been. To, I was doing a bit of traveling. I went to a, a soccer game in London, and also the French Open. Two different kinds of experiences, I would say. But being in, but th did you see that there were some some similarities? Didn't matter what the sport was. That, I, that I being just, in the stands. I was, I would just notice yeah, um, well, two different things. One, one was the uh, FA Cup. I was Chelsea versus Liverpool, and I was on the Chelsea. I'm not a fan of either team, but um, like people were like actually like crying and like very sad when the team was losing. While I like at a tennis match, people are just cheering for a good game. So it doesn't matter who you're cheering for, who you want to win. They just want. They're just really cheering for the quality. So if someone they're actually opposing, 
done something well or been impressed, then like people would actually cheer. So that was, you know, some insight that I learned. Got it. And you know, that's it. people do. People get real wrapped up in the stands. You can get real wrapped up around an axle in the stands. You can cry. You can even see when a ball is hit, you can see people sort of moving their body even. Like, like they're following the ball or they're gonna catch. That's not the court. That's the stands. Great, thanks Franklin. Tanya. Hello. Hello. So this could be jumping ahead, but the I'll let example you know. that I have is basketball related. So I attended a Drew League basketball game and When you're seeing these teams together, they are not as familiar with each other as a professional sports team. I was noticing the interaction between the coaches and the team. So on the court, you have kind of a leader that assumes the position naturally, but you also have the coaches yelling stuff out during the game. So I guess it's also a question of for the coach, are they considered to be in the stands or on the court? Neither okay. is, is, is how is how I would answer answer that question. So it's not it's not the court and it's not the stands. It's a it's a distinct position of coaching. Right. And in order to play a game at a high level or at an Olympic level, there there is not one Olympic participant that does not have a coach. Right. So it is. It, it is a matter of um, performance, right? And, and performance is greatly enhanced on the court by having a coach. Got it. Right. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Ashley. Yeah. Hello. Hello. So I, I uh, am a PhD student in the Healing School of Public Health. So my question, uh, I fully plan on being an academic right? So as an academic, do you see yourself as a leader or are you in that distinct coaching position you just mentioned? Uh, that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. Well, you know, what, so when I, I started out my career as a social worker working, working um, on the floors of group homes and um, when, when, when um, you know, I would call them my partners because, you know, we all had to get through the shift together. Uh, they say, oh, wow, Kush, you're going all the way when they knew I was getting a PhD. So actually, congratulations, I haven't gone all the way. Um, so one thing I discovered after I got my PhD and became an academic was that the being of an academic was nothing like I thought it was going to be. Like, the, the court of academia, right? What that, you know, there's, there's networking and tenure and publication and there's Senate faculty and there's adjunct. It's a whole world, right? So be, I am being an academic in that world. Right, but part of my performance as an academic, part of what goes with being in that world, is mentoring, teaching. Right. So when in that world, that is something that is done in that world. Right. It's part of that conversational domain. It's not part of all fields conversational domain. So that's how that's how I'd answer that. Is that's just part of that's what put that's. That's part of who you be as an academic. That's part of your performance. Great question. Thank you. That's helpful. So, so, all right. So that's in the stands and in the court. So now let's answer back to our question. So next slide, Dylan. So if I answer the question, ordinary leaders from the stands, right? It looks like this, right? Most of us, We assume that extraordinary leaders have some secret ingredient in them that makes them extraordinary. If I make that assumption, I am answering that question from the stands. There's something inside of them that makes them extraordinary, right? So we do that. Oh, wow. Well, look, you know, that 
CEO, um, that great leader in that country. And then what we do is we look at those leaders that have some, some secret ingredient inside them that makes them extraordinary, right? And then we try to emulate those leaders and their characteristics and styles, right? And there's books and books and books about the attributes and characteristics of leaders. And there's lists, right? If I said, well, what makes a great leader? You'd probably say things like, well, charisma and trustworthiness, right? There, there are lists of attributes and then we go about emulating those, okay? So that's how answering that question looks like from the stance. Let's answer that question from the court. All right, next. From the court, answering that question looks, well, first it begins with the realization. Go ahead and click Dylan. When, if you will get on the court with me for an instant, right? Right. I mean, we're, there's leadership happening right now, right? We're on a court, so to speak. So the answer begins with the realization that these extraordinary leaders are ordinary people like you and me. Right? You have to start there. These extraordinary leaders are ordinary people like you and me. Okay. All right. So if you're with me so far, then you, you might ask, well, okay, go ahead. Next slide, Dylan. What makes these ordinary people such effective leaders then? What makes them such effective leaders? Well, if they're ordinary people like you or me, what makes them such effective leaders? Okay, next. Maybe what makes them so effective has nothing to do with their title or authority or what they know. Somebody said technical expertise. Perhaps what makes these ordinary people effective is that somehow they have come to see, comprehend, and therefore interact with life differently than most of us do. What if what makes an extraordinary leader extraordinary is how they see? Okay, well then that begs the next question. Well, how, what do they see? Like, does the world actually occur differently for these extraordinary leaders? So I want you to try on like a jacket what's on this next slide. Okay, try on like a jacket. Perhaps leadership is less about what you know and more about how you see. And I, and I use the word see loosely, right? It, Interchange how you hear, how you process or interpret the world. Okay, so I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you an example. All right, I'm going to give you a situation to illustrate the point. All right, next slide, Dylan. So I assert that you and I do not interact with the situation at hand. Okay. We do not interact with the facts of the matter. You and I respond and react to the way that situation is occurring for us. Okay. And that occurring is idiosyncratic to us, which means it's unique to us. So that same situation possibly occurs differently to another. For those of you that, that, that have been in arguments with loved ones and had the experience, like that is not what happened. That is not what was said. You're, you're familiar with those conversations. And the other person goes, yes, it was. All right. Who's right? Probably everyone, right? Because the world occurs differently and idiosyncratically differently for different people, okay? So there's the facts of the situation, and then there's how those facts occur for us, all right? Go ahead, Dylan. I'm going to give you an example for my life. So I uh, was 
uh, hired by the LA LGBT Center to write a $5 million, what a $13 million grant, a federal grant. And for those of you that have ever written a federal grant, you need every second of the six weeks they give you, right? There were two weeks left. Right? So here's, there's the situation. Here's what I encountered uh, when I went into assess. Okay. So what I heard were things like this. And the, the, the actual program was actually providing uh, accepting homes for LGBTQ foster youth, all right? I was, there was no push. We, we have no way to find these children, all right? The, there's no, the, the county has no funds. We never been in the business of minors. We're an adult community center let alone other people's minors, okay? We've never done anything in the child welfare system. We, I mean, we want to help. We understand that the, that the organization that serves LGBT foster youth just went out of business. Uh, and the other thing, Kush, is this grant's going to require an evaluation. We don't have any internal research infrastructure to do an evaluation. There's two weeks left, right? It's two weeks left. Right. Well, I asked the team to make a choice. Okay, I got it. What should we do? All right. So go ahead, Bill. Okay. So the way of being in actions that the team, that I saw from the team, were consistent with the way the situation occurred for them. And in those phrases, you can hear how the situation occurred for them. It was something like, oh, this is an uphill battle. Okay, go ahead. So, you know, there were the facts, right? What were the facts? Well, they had the experience they had. There was the time left, there was the time left. They had the infrastructure they had, the county had the constraints it had, right? That's the facts, okay? However, how did those facts occur? Go ahead. This is pointless, it's a tall order. This is almost impossible. We're in no position this is gonna be a mistake and we've got a whole bunch of other stuff going on. We can't make this a priority. So what would anyone do it, when, when anyone had that occurring? The team said, no. So, well, so I went back to the chief of staff um, who, who just retired. Um, uh, amazing, amazing, amazing leader. His name is, is, is Daryl Cummings. And so I went to Daryl's office and I said, well, they don't want to do it, right? It's, and I'm not going to, you know, like I can't make them, right? They don't want to do it. This is going to take a lot of work. We can't have people that, that aren't into it, okay? So next slide. So Daryl walks in the room and this, this action, so Daryl says, it's not acceptable. And he walks into the room. And he says the following to this team. He says, look, the gay and lesbian adolescent social services where Kush worked, it's gone, okay? However, Kush worked there. We have those data, right? LGBTQ youth are, dis are called out in this announcement. We're well positioned. Nobody else we know is applying, right? We've got the consultants and, and, and this sealed the deal. He said, and every day that we sit here debating whether we write this grant or not, every day a child is in pain. Every day. Okay, so next slide. The facts had not changed in you know, the few hours between when the team said no and when Daryl walked into the room. It was the same experience, the same time left, same infrastructure, same county. Right? 
However, Daryl had shifted their occurring. And what was their occurring now? It was something like, well, if not us, who? And if not now, when? Every day, every day. And the team chose again. And they said, all right, we'll do it. Okay. And here, here are the outcomes on the next slide. We got that sucker in early, a day early, but it was in early. It was the highest scoring proposal in the nation. And the only, I mean, we were competing with states and counties. This was a community-based organization. It is still, I think, the highest amount ever given to an LGBT cause by the federal government, $13 million over five years. It put LGBTQ youth in their needs on the national map. It got the administration to say LGBT and children in the same sentence over and over and over. And not only that, in order to be able to write that grant, we had to get support letters. And we were able to get not only support letters from the Department of Children and Family Services and the juvenile court, we got 19 agency and community partners to sign on in less than two weeks, right? Out of every day. So what I'm pointing to is that the extraordinary leaders have come to be masters of context. Go ahead, the next slide, Dylan. And what Daryl did was by shifting the context, right? Or said another way, how the situation occurred for the team, the actions the team took and the results those actions generated were markedly different. That was a future that was not gonna happen otherwise in the prevailing context, okay? Yeah. So perhaps, next slide. Again, it's not what you know, it's how you see, okay? And I'm gonna deepen that a little more. So. And, and now I want you to look for yourself, okay? Okay, so okay, it's not what, you know, when, when I am exercising leadership, it's not about what I know, it's about how I see. A person's way of being and their actions are correlated with or in a dance with the way in which what they are dealing with occurs for them. So your way of being and acting are correlated the way in which, the situation occurs for you. Is it gonna occur for you as an uphill battle? You're gonna say, no, thank you. If it occurs for you as a, if not us who, and not now when, you're gonna say yes. So then that begs another question. Okay, well, so if they, what shapes the way in which something occurs for a person? And then what is that occurring for being a leader and exercising leadership effectively? Well, what is it that they see? All right, well, Let's start to answer some of that question. The occurring, and now we're getting to this matter of context. How something occurs for you is shaped by the context you hold for that thing or that situation. Go ahead and click. You may not notice it, but every situation you deal with shows up for you in some context or the other, every situation. And then that context governs how you're going to react. And how does it govern that? In fact, a context constrains and shapes the way the situation occurs for us. And consequently, the way we interact with the situation. Um, go ahead. It's almost like there's a context functions as a invisible, mostly invisible to us, cognitive lens through which we see the worlds, others, and ourselves. And what that context can do is it highlights certain aspects of the situation, it dims others, and there are some things that are completely blanked out. There are some things that you don't, you don't see. So when your loved one said, yes, I said that, and you go, no, I didn't, they very well could have, but the context you have for them, blank that out. 
So the occurring is shaped by context. I'm going and I'm gonna talk about it. I'm gonna demonstrate it for you. Okay, you, I mean, you know, this is all great, Kush. Okay, I can get it, but let's demonstrate it for you. You ready? All right. So I'm gonna need a I need a volunteer to read this paragraph. Volunteer to read a paragraph. Waldo. Okay. Oh, thank you so much, everyone, for volunteering. Especially when there's a hundred and some people on the Zoom. It's really great. Take something to do that. All right. So, Dylan, next slide. And let's have Waldo read the slide for us. All righty. Holding it down for all the uh, social welfare MSW students. Oh, <laughs> good. My people. All right, John. All right, John. So um, here it is. A newspaper is better than a magazine. A seashore is a better place than a street. At first, it is better to run than to walk. You may have to try several times. It takes some skill, but it, it's easy to learn. Even young children can enjoy it. Once successful, complications are minimal. Birds seldom get too close. Rain, however, soaks in very fast. Too many people doing the same thing can also cause problems. One needs lots of room. If there are no complications, it can be very peaceful. A rock will serve as an anchor. If things break loose from it, however, you will not get a second chance." End quote. How about that? Make any sense? Waldo, did it make any sense to you what you just read? First glance, no, but no. I need to read it again. <laughs> yeah, well, give you, we're gonna give you a chance to, right? I suspect that this paragraph made little or no sense for any of you. Um, and if it did, we have to have another conversation. Uh, on the next slide, you're gonna see the paragraph again, okay? And I'm gonna ask you to read it to yourself. Okay, go ahead, Dylan. I advance it now? Yep, big reveal. All right, read it again to yourself. I gave you, in one word, a context for these sentences that without any context make no sense, right? I gave you kite, and now something unintelligible is intelligible, right? So context, it's critical to being a human being. Otherwise, we would have no way of making sense of all the data coming at us, right? But context also, while they make things intelligible, they highlight certain things, they dim certain things, and they blank out certain things. But when given a context, a world snapped into place. And there's, there's something we say in the course, next slide, Dylan. The, the context is decisive. In that, you can just click through it, the context has the power to shape and color how the situation you're dealing with occurs for you. Therefore, it's decisive in determining your way of being and your actions, right? The context uses us, so to speak in that it shapes our being and our action, okay? So now there's a couple of kinds of context I wanna introduce you to, all right? So you got that you have context, you need it, there's two kinds. In the world of context, we distinguish between a default context and a created context. The default context, so, so to speak, came automatically with the situation you're dealing with. Right? You just had nothing to, you, you had no say in it, but just popped up, okay? A created context, all right? Oh, 
Well, never mind. Actually, yeah, let's get to that last point, Dylan, on this slide. Oh, there we go. And that automaticity is constructed out of the past. Right? A default context, you have some past experience with the situation, something similar comes up, and you, boom, you've got a default context, right? I have a default context for my mom. My mom really doesn't have to say anything. I know what's going to come out of her mouth because that's what came out of her mouth last time. Right? It's just a default context I have for my mom. And you have a default context for the people around you and you have a default context for yourself. Right? And I assert you've had no say in that. Well, let's talk about the other kind of context. Right? A created context. Right? distinct from a default context in that it is brought from the future back into the present. And it is created, it is not automatic, it has to be generated. It's got the power to actually reveal things that perhaps were hidden or obscured by the default context. Um, and Perhaps what makes extraordinary leaders extraordinary is that they can effectively replace the default context for a situation you're dealing with, with a created context for that situation. But before you can do it for others, right? Remember leadership begins with leading yourself. You're gonna have to practice doing that with yourself. By the way, there's a little by the way in those parentheses, you came to this call with a default context for leader and leadership. Right. Some default context for leader and leadership. And that's something to look at. That's something to take. What is my, what's the default context I have for leader and leadership? And how might, the, how might I replace that with the created context? All right, so let's keep going. Context is decisive. Default or created, it's decisive, okay? So now we're going to apply this to leading yourself. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna ask you a question, okay? The question, imagine I'm asking you directly this question. When does your UCLA degree begin? Somebody, when's it start? When's, when's some, Somebody shout it out. Come off mute, shout it out. Oh, okay, we're in the chat. Way before you've ever got to school. We're already uh, in it. Ah, uh, these people are already leaders, Dylan. If you weren't already leaders, right, or leading from where you are, you might think, right, the, what's the default context? If somebody asks you, oh, when's, when's your, when school start? What's the default context? What would you say before? I talked to you about this today. Somebody the start date. Yeah, the this, fall, you know, August, orientation, September, right? That's the, that's the default context, okay? But as some of you have already done, we can answer that question another way, right? Notice what shifts when you create the context that your UCLA degree begins, and somebody said this right up front in the chat, A plus now, right? Right now at 7.09 p.m. on Tuesday, July 19th. Welcome to grad school. All right, Dylan, I think you're going to send them into a breakout now. Am I right? You are correct, Koosh. So we just covered a lot of ground in the stands and on the court. You heard the example of, of Daryl at glass shifting a uphill battle to a, if not us who, and if not now, when. We had a demonstration of context with Kite, default context, created context. Okay, so you're gonna go back in your breakouts and uh, a couple of people had to leave. We got some messages in the chat. And we have, a, we have a raised hand too. So oh, excuse me. Yeah, Siraj, please. That, that was a mistake, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Well, it's nice to see you. 
and talk to you. <laughs> All right, off you go. Okay, so we are gonna we're gonna return to the groups that Aaron assigned us to last time. There might be a person missing. We had a couple people had to step away. Again, repeat the same process. So we have a quickness to this alphabetically by first name. First person is also the timer. Two minutes each. If your UCLA graduate program begins now, 7.09 on a Tuesday night, what would there be to address? So that's, that's a question. You can do both of these or you can just take one. But what would I do? Oh, grad school started tonight. What context, what would being in that context, what would the impact be? What would I address tomorrow morning? or even tonight before I go to bed. So that's a question. Or the other option is, what is a new context you could create for your UCLA graduate school journey? Like you get to say, I'm co-leading a workshop tonight, a leadership laboratory, such that over a hundred graduate students from eight different disciplines might discover something inside themselves, already there, but they never looked for it before. And the process of discovering that tonight might make their fall quarter a notch stronger, faster, more successful, more on the court. And that solid beginning to an incredible journey of two, three, four, or more years, depending on your program, starting well and ending well, that we, that we tonight may be launching voices into the future of making our world work. So that's, that's a created context that has me here with you on a Tuesday night. So for yourself, as we go into the groups, pick one of the two questions. Alpha by first name, first person's the timer, two minutes each, and speculate. Allow yourself, there's no right answers and there are no wrong answers. But this subject matter is incredible. It's you and your life. Okay, any questions before we go into our second breakout? Okay, Aaron, are we ready? We are ready. All Thank right. You. Thank you, Aaron. 10 minutes. Our time is 713. All right, here comes everyone. Welcome back, welcome back. Quick question, Dylan, how long is the session gonna go on until? Uh, till 8.30, it's listed, California time. Gotcha. Thank you, Hitesh. All right, Kush, I think we're, I think we have most everyone yep. back. Looks like we're back. All right, so we were li we were living in a default context of well, you know, I got some time. School starting in September, right? And we created a context that starts now, like right now, like you can be sitting in class tomorrow. What what now does that context reveal that there is to do? Let's hear from folks. Shall we, Dylan? Yes. Yeah, great. Becky. Um, Hi. We had a, I had a really great conversation with um, Hitesh and Yvonne and, and Sibel. And we were just kind of, and one of the things that we were kind of talking about is as we're all getting ready to come and start programs, all coming from such a variety of different backgrounds, uh, one of the best things that I'm excited to do for myself, and I hope you all are too, is to 
prepare to kind of put our best foot forward. So like, for example, I know that I don't come from a, I don't have a ton of experience using Excel recently. So I'm super excited to jump into the Excel and some of the other pre-courses ahead of getting started at FEMBA. That way I can make sure that I'm at least putting all of my energy in ahead of time to make sure that I'm showing up day one, um, ready to go. And they said it better, right? Start now, really good. Asia. What did you hey, see? everybody. Um, so we actually talked about some of the similar um, themes on if it starts now, just different ways that we would prepare mentally, um, whether it's, you know, organization schedules, some of us have to move and um, just the whole logistics piece of that. Um, the reality of accepting that it's happening now. It's not this future thing that, you know, is going to happen at some far date in a, you know, in, Someday. It, it's happening today, um, yeah. which kind of brings its own level of anxiety, but also excitement. Um, and then I think what we enjoyed the most was the concept that you introduced um, when you were talking about future context and thinking about how we can apply where we're trying to go and kind of bring it back to where we are now to frame your focus, if you will. Yeah. Um, so that was some of the things that we discussed. Um, and I love the discussion overall because how we perceive things is real to each and every one of us. And that may look different as we start out, but the hope is that as we get with our cohort, we're open enough to learn from each other so we can be better than we were when we started. That's so good. I, I just underline, 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 right? When you get, and I could hear you got it, when you get that, wow, like my occurring world might be different than the, this person's occurring world. I might wanna inquire into, what the world's like for them, rather than making an assumption that it's like it is for me. And leaders that can do that, they can truly inquire into what's important for people, how the world looks for them. People follow them anywhere. Really great, Asia. Thank you. Ricky. Thanks, Dr. Cooper. Um, well, shout out to my public health folks out there. Um, I see you. <laughs> um, and I think so as far as our breakout session goes, you know, logistics and the academic structures aside, I think kind of this overall theme shared between all of us was this idea of building community. So a lot of us were talking about, you know, getting to know folks and talking to faculty, um, networking with colleagues and classmates, whether it be you know, in your program or across campus, like including events like this, you know, kind of that platform to do that, which really ties into that idea of imposter syndrome and knowing that, you know, there's people out there who are living and breathing the same experiences um, on, you know, at least a foundational level and knowing that you're all here for a reason and to do great things is uh, really incredible. And so um, I think it's great that we're able to kind of already do that. Um, through this and hopefully similar events to come. Um, but yeah, that's kind of overview. That's great. And and I know Dylan, that's probably music to your ears because I know you know you Dylan, you know, Dylan like wakes up in community and goes to bed in community. Um, and so that that got created. Um, congratulations, Dylan. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Preeti, Preeti, for for seeing that, you know, really looking like and seeing. And then seeing, oh, what else is possible, right? Because this UCLA is a build your own adventure. You know, th there are so many resources within one square mile. You know, once you're physically on campus and now it's just exponentially multiplied with our digital overlay. So thank you for seeing that and representing public health. <laughs> Dylan, I don't know, uh, you're, I'm not watching time. So I just love talking to people, so I'll keep going. Well, I think you um, should talk to a couple more people because you're really okay. good at it. <laughs> well, I just enjoy it. Catherine, hello. Hi, 
Hey, nice to, to meet everyone and to see everyone. Um, within our group, I think what came up was talking through, if it starts now, giving ourselves the grace to understand that it's transition and that it is going to take time to learn how to do it, um, particularly for myself, as well as another one of my uh, group members who are fully employed MBA students who are part of the FEMA program. Um, we are we were joking, like having to take time off for orientation, but that's not the same thing as taking off for work. So um, learning how that it learning how to do that, and that's um, that's a new skill set, and that's a new experience for us. On a personal level, um, the new context I'm trying to create is UCLA was my undergrad school, so this is a new experience of what it's going to be like for grad school, and. Uh, very excited, but also trying to check my uh, my habits coming in as a as an Anderson student as opposed to just an undergrad. That's that's so great. Cause the past, I mean, you know, the past is comfortable. We know that one, right? And it's so easy to just drag it into the future and then live into it, right? And you know, people say, "Wow, the more things change, the more they stay the same." Like, that's why they say that. It's because we take our past, we stick it in our future, or you can only live into the future. You actually can't live into the past. The reason it looks like the past is because we put it there, right? And what you're seeing is like, okay, I could put that aside. I could put the past back in the past and I could look gnarly. Like beginner's mind, right? It's a new UCLA, what kind of is in some ways, um, it's a whole new world, but yeah, really great, Catherine. Yeah, Kush, why don't we, why, why don't you uh, call in the, the three people with their hands raised and then we'll we'll proceed after that. All right, Danielle, Charles, and Amara. If your names are in there, then you're getting called on. All right, Danielle. Hey. Please. I'm going to go in that order. Hi everyone, Danielle. Um, I am uh, going into the MSW MPH dual program. Super excited about that, yes. Um, and uh, I think one thing that we talked about a lot is really um, understanding that even in this space, like is an opportunity for us to comport ourselves or be who we wanna be when we think about who we wanna be in grad school. And I, you know, I, there were several of us who um, had gone to big public schools before. There were several of us who um, have been working for many, many years and are coming to school for the first time after having been in the workforce for a long time. So I think um, really just acknowledging that it's an adjustment, but rather than living um, and, and approaching this time as something that is going to be in the future and that we have to fear and prepare for, really just acknowledging that it's already happening, um, and so we may as well just like do the things we we would have wanted the future self to do and just like move forward. And I think for me, that means like developing relationships with other people and not um, waiting for the next time that I see a colleague or professor or student, but really just trying to build those relationships sooner rather than later. I couldn't have said it better. Life only happens now. Right? Both the past and the future figment of your imagination. Right. Very good. Thanks, Danielle. Charles. All right, Dr. Kush. Hello, everyone. My name is Charles. I'm part of the FEMBA program. And uh, while we were discussing uh, with my group, let me set my timer, so make sure I'm within that two minutes. So um, I believe everyone is already a leader uh, because everyone participated even before the official classes began. And everyone is coming from a different background. I believe this type of workshop will be very meaningful if we fully engage with uh, different leaders' perspective, because we all come from different backgrounds and we have all different ideas and different agendas. So by interacting, actively interacting uh, with uh, this session and with everybody's idea, we're able to improve our leadership skills. And especially um, by being a leader, I believe it's uh, one of the biggest uh, ability is to 
express our minds uh, via the power of language to have the influence on other people uh, is to have influence on other people. So our intellectual collisions of different ideas through you know usage of language could have uh, extraordinary outcomes. You know, uh, somebody might heard about my biggest passion right now about spirituality and uh, why would I uh, switch from my logistics background to spirituality which is I want to take this opportunity to share with everyone is because I believe uh, uh, quantum physics have already closed the gap between science and uh, spirituality so we got to understand we are a spiritual being having a human body experience. So we used to, a uh, majority of, of us are programs with limited beliefs that we, we think in an old pattern. But once we understand we're spiritual being, we're limitless. There's no limit. There's nothing is impossible in our world and we can achieve anything that we, we can imagine in our world. And especially our group consciousness can create anything we want for the in, entire humanity. So that's just something I want to share. Thank you, Charles. Um, and you know, this, this, what, if you think about when you're experiencing leadership or you're observing a leader, what are they doing? I mean, think of it, just think about, oh, 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 look. look what fundamentally and, and charles you, you know feel free to answer like, what what are they doing what are these leaders doing when you look at them leading we're shaping the future but how are they doing that like just how are they doing that by don't overthink it uh by huh? influence They're shaping thoughts yeah shaping but how thoughts. how and... are they what how what what it what like on a video camera, communicating what, articulating they're, they're talking, showing right. talking that is exact they are talking right language right and i'll give you you know i can even give you the sneak pre like i'll tell you the punchline for the the course because it doesn't make a difference one way or the other having it we say that leadership is an exercise in language which creates a future that wasn't gonna happen in the prevailing context. Which future fulfills the, the concerns of the relevant parties such that they see the possibility of making a noteworthy contribution? Right? right? And Dylan's the next, you know, so Dylan's gonna start talking about an aspect of language here in a moment. Um, and, and so I wanted to sort of just pull that out of what you said is, but if they don't see that they can make a noteworthy contribution to that future and it doesn't fulfill their concerns, you're not going to influence Bubkis. Really great. Thank you for allowing me to ride on your coattails a bit, Charles. Amara. Hi, everybody. My name is Amara, and I come to you from the medical school. I don't think we've had somebody from medical school speak yet. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, when given the question of like, what do you, uh, the second question, I believe, when it was like the context you want to be in for grad school, uh, for your grad school journey in UCLA, I, I have always said, you know, I want grad school to be a place where I can do something that I know I cannot do outside of the school, right? Because I've worked before going to grad school. And there's just something magical about being on a college campus where you can talk with so many different types of people, get different types of input, uh, perspectives, and just the support you get at a school like UCLA, right? So then I was thinking, oh, when I get to grad school, I'm gonna do this, 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 and that. And I'm like, no, you can actually start doing that now. It's not necessarily the grad school that will change the ability for you to do that, but it's about you taking the step forward and saying, you know, I'm gonna do that now. Uh, so in my head, I said, okay, now I need to start defensive calendaring. <laughs> you know, like I need to start doing the things that I wanted to do now and, and just be prepared to do so in an efficient way, however that may look like in grad school. So really, thought-provoking question for myself and also for my group. Yeah, 
and you know your 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 point is really great. You're pointing to you know we, we there's some default context that creeps in there about grad school. It, it, it's just going to right. You, you can't get rid of your default context. You can just notice them and put them aside over and over and over again. Um, but there so but there could be a created context like wow like what could this be about rather than making it through or yeah earning a little bit more or you know getting a dig some letters after my name or what it whatever right what could it be about yeah that's a great inquiry thank you all right. Thank you. Uh -oh. well, we, 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 we have got a, late, a sneaker in her. We got a late county reporting. <laughs> All right. Hattie. I had to. I mean, it, it was teed up for me to kind of chime in, chime in over here. I don't know if you guys probably didn't because you were attending and listening to people talking. I put my comments on the on the chat window, and I was sharing this with my breakout group as well. Is I actually want to take head on. I'm the, an MBA is just about top line and bottom lines. So I don't think it's just about an additional degree. I don't think it's about going back to school to get that school experience and validation. Yes, it is all of that, but just look around us. I mean, the planet that we are on right now, the things that are going on around us, the level of the level of seriousness, some major, major issues behoove that we pay attention to. <laughs> and a lot of us including me we're not even really kind of we don't have it out of our busy lives we don't have the time and the bandwidth to really kind of take that on as an extra project but look at the energy crisis that's looming on our planet look at the the way we are consuming the way we are i was listening to a podcast the other day 96 percent of the biomass on the planet is humans and cattle or you know uh, things that we eat basically there's only four percent of the biomass that's left for the wild and the wilderness I mean, you think about situations and how we are really expanding ourselves on towards using and almost abusing the planet with energy, with sustainability, with environment. It goes around in a full circle. And I feel that the reasons for doing an MBA has to be much, much more deeply connected to actually understanding and tackling those existential issues. Because guess what? We have one planet. This is it. <laughs> Um, I, I was just looking up on LinkedIn that people are trying to go to Mars and, you know, there is the race supposedly to get there before SpaceX does with Y Combinator funding some companies. I'm like, we have one planet, the one that we can stay on and that we can live on. We know of as a proof. Let's do everything in our human capacity possible to make that a, 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 an assurance for our next generation and generations after that, going by the rate we are going. The next few decades are looking really, really hard to get by. Forget generations. So that's my, <laughs> that's my reason for why I want to change the, or that's my reason why I want to put that context in, in my mind and in my family and friends and everybody else's mind is that this is why we need an MBA to give that generalist point of view and be able to understand how we can save the planet. And, and you know, if there's no say. accident, that, that who's speaking to you today is somebody from Anderson and someone from social welfare. Right? It's no accident. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. We're kind of an odd couple, except we've been really creating some really powerful momentum. Because you need it all. Yep. You need it all. And it's all organizations when it comes down to it, right? The, the people that work in them. So, really great. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for it, was, it was worth the sneak in. Oh, he was worth yes. the sneak in. And you, and you got to re read what he wrote also. It was well, well stated. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're rounding the, we're rounding the two thirds. We're, we're in the last lap here. So we're going to, you know, we're going to keep going. Um, and but, and Dylan, know, if we just get to, if we just powerfully get through integrity, like, you know, I think like, that'd be, that'd be enough. Yeah, perfect, perfect. And, you know, just I, I want to share one thing Akush has taught me, you know, and this is I'm, I'm the guy with the business school, I should know this. But you know, we, we talk about nonprofit and for profit, like that's such a huge divide. And a nonprofit organization or a for profit organization. That's actually they're not that different. You know, it's human beings trying to do something collectively together that they can't achieve individually. 
and in a for-profit you you create more you create more output than the input required and you call that profit and in a non-profit you create more output than, than the input required and you use that for ongoing operating expenses but in both cases it's human beings like why are we in the room together what are we aiming at you know are we google trying to make a better algorithm or are we glass trying to take care of children who are in poor placements or in Amara's world, you know, am I going to do some defensive calendaring because I really want my graduate school to be awesome. I want to do something at grad school that I can't do anywhere else. So, um, so moving ahead, we're going to give you something one more and it's going to, I hope you can see it's kind of getting a little more actionable. We're kind of aiming and in the, in the being a leader course that Kush and I teach, um, there are four foundational factors for being a leader and exercising leadership effectively as your natural self-expression, your voice, not somebody else's voice, not what would Steve Jobs do? What would Hitesh do? What would Catherine do? What would Preeti do? What would Amara do? What would Charles do? Right? You could hear the different voices. And aren't they beautiful when they're all out there? Because I get a little inspiration from Amara. I get a little spirituality from Charles. I get a little big picture, let's cross boundaries from Hitesh, right? So the four foundational factors, one, being a person of integrity, two, being authentic, three, being given being in action by something bigger than oneself, four, being cause in the matter. Now, again, this is a six unit course, so, you know, we can't do all this tonight, but we want to, we want to cook up some cookies and waft Wow, you know when chocolate chip cookies cook and the smell wafts down the hall, we want to waft a little, waft, waft, what's the right way to say that? We want to send some olfactory engagement. We want to get the smell of leadership down the hallway. Because when mastered, when I take on personal integrity, when I take on being authentic, when I take on being up to something bigger than myself and being this shall be because this shall be because I say so. As was said with glass in Kush's example, Daryl said, if not us, who? If not now, when? We can sit around and have a bureaucratic debate about how hard it is to write a grant. But every day we do that, there are children in the wrong placement. And there's no, there's no knight on a white horse coming in. Daryl just demonstrated being cause in the matter. Okay, so we're going to look at being a person of integrity, and we may get to being authentic. Okay, so integrity. We're going to have a different distinction about integrity tonight than possibly it's been introduced so far. What is integrity for a person? Now, this is, again, not the truth. This is a jacket. And try this on. Does this look good on me? Does this have anything to do with my voice? my graduate school journey being customized from me, by me, for me, but for other people in service of something bigger. What we see when we look is that integrity for a person is a matter of one's word. Nothing more, nothing less. When I relate to my word as who I am, in a leadership moment, there's integrity present. And with that integrity, there's something available that's not available if it's not there. If I, this is leadership begins with leading myself. If I don't honor my word, I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. every day and go be a medical student for four years. Yeah, you guys are epic, right? You give your word to jump through everything there is to jump through so that you can fulfill the Hippocratic Oath someday and be trusted at the level that doctors are trusted. So the degree to which that word is whole, complete, unbroken, unimpaired, sound, in perfect condition, the degree to which we honor our word is the degree to which we will have integrity. 
This is a foundation for being a person who can raise their hand in the universe and say, excuse me, world, I have an idea. And the world says, okay, Amara, let's hear, let's go. What do you see is possible? And the world is hungry to hear from you all. It really is. You guys need to get with it and graduate tomorrow. <laughs> the world is ready. Okay, so we're going to de define word the way we're distinguishing it tonight. So there are six elements of my word. Okay, we're going to get really, really precise here. Number one, what you said you would do. Right? Whatever you said you will do or not do, and in the case of do, doing it on time, right? This includes requests made of me, responding in a timely fashion. Number two, what you know to do. Whatever you know to do or not do. And if it is due, doing it as you know it is meant to be done and doing it on time, unless you've explicitly said to the contrary. Leaders are count onable. When I give my word, it's what I say I'm going to do, and it's what I know to do that goes with that. I'm a husband. I gave my word for the rest of my life. I am Marissa's count honorable person. And there's a world that I dwell in as a husband. I gave my word. What is expected of you, speaking of marriage, unexpressed requests of you by all those with whom you wish to have a workable relationship. So whatever you are expected or requested to do or not do by anyone with whom you wish to have a workable relationship, even when not explicitly expressed. And in the case of do, doing it on time, unless you've explicitly said to the contrary. And here's where it's crazy. Note, what I expect from others is not part of their word. With others, I must change my unexpressed requests into explicit requests. So it's not, it's not both ways, but my wife has expectations of me that are unexpressed. And part of my word to her is that I honor who we are as a partnership in the world. That's part of my word that I gave when I gave my vow. What you say is so. We heard some of that just a moment ago. Amara has a stand for how graduate school could be. I'm just, I just, I circled it. Defensive calendar. Never heard that. Love it. Picasso said, great artists, good artists borrow and great artists steal. Steve Jobs loved to quote Picasso. I'm totally stealing that. Defensive calendaring. You know, you're going to go through graduate school. You're going to, you're not a robot. This is not a four-year sprint. It's a four-year marathon with sprints embedded, but you're gonna need recovery. You're gonna need restoration. I heard compassion a few shares back. I think Catherine may have said that, right? But you get to say what is so when you give your word. I say I'm going to UCLA because I have a vision for my life. I'm not a bachelor's degree candidate anymore. I am a master's degree or even a doctoral candidate. And what I say is so is that I'm count honorable for the next two, three, or four years or more to be on the court doing what graduate students do. What you say you stand for. This one we also heard, right? Just barely scratch the surface in this workshop and listen to what people's commitments are about our planet, about our society about our systems working for everyone with no one and nothing left out. Leaders say what they stand for. It's their word. Who I am tonight is I'm speaking to the people who are going to run the world for the better 
based on who they be and are able to be and who they become during graduate school at UCLA. And the last of the six is moral, ethical, and legal standards. There are rules and regulations. Once you pass, you know, once you earn your medical degree and you pass your exams and you are authorized by the governance of the state in which you practice medicine, right? So we say who you are is your word. That is integrity for a person who is up to being a leader and exercising leadership effectively as their natural self-expression. So of those six aspects, where do we struggle with our word, with honoring our word, right? I am gonna not eat cookies after 7 p.m. I am gonna get up at 5 a.m. and exercise for 45 minutes before I slam a cup of coffee, right? Leadership begins with leading ourselves. Sometimes the person I break my word to first is the person I see when I look in the mirror in the morning. So what's that about? So we're gonna talk, we're gonna distinguish about honoring, not about, we're going to distinguish what it is to honor one's word. What it is to honor one's word is to keep your word and to keep it on time. Or whenever you will not be keeping your word, just as soon as you become aware you will not be keeping your word, including not keeping your word on time, saying to everyone impacted, A, that you will not be keeping your word, and B, that you will, that you will keep that word in the future, and by when, or that you won't be keeping your word at all, and see what you will do to deal with the impact on others of the failure to keep your word or to keep it on time. Integrity is a function of the degree to which one honors one's word and it's unbroken withness. I go to sleep like a baby every night with a beautifully clean space. And it's taken me several decades to get my word where it's count honorable. But I see it most immediately with my wife and with my two children. I have a commitment to be a certain kind of husband and a certain kind of father. And I love UCLA and I put a lot of hours into UCLA for two decades. I way over identify with UCLA, right? It's a healthy codependent relationship, but it's a little codependent, right? But I honor my word to my wife and my children first. My employment is a means to the ends of being the kind of husband and the kind of father I'm committed to being. And oh, by the way, I get to make a difference in the world. So we're saying, Honoring on one's word doesn't mean that you keep it all the time. Sometimes you have to, you can't be two places at once. That happens to big people living big lives. So what do we do when it's a situation, I can't keep my word and I'm going to honor my word? First, we honor that we gave our word. Sometimes it is wholly inappropriate to keep your word. And sometimes you just don't feel like it. It's counterintuitive. Honoring one's word to oneself is often most challenging. Integrity and performance. For high performance or to make a big difference, Integrity is required. Integrity sources workability. The difference in performance when integrity is in place personally and when it's in place at the level of group, it's not 5% or 10%. It is exponential. 
what is available when integrity is there, when people can trust people. Charles said he was going to handle that part of the project. I know that is handled because I trust Charles, because Charles has earned my trust. And how he's earned my trust is that he honors his word. A, he does what he says he's going to do. Or B, because we are working MBA students with jobs and a lot going on, when he can't honor his word, the second he knows he's not going to meet the deadline, I've come to know that Charles always lets us know as soon as he knows. He honors his word. He doesn't sweep it under the rug. He sends the WhatsApp. Guys, we we need my deliverable by the Thursday night meeting. I'm slammed at work. My boss came in and just dumped this thing on my lap. I need help. I am not going to make my deadline. And as a team member, do I beat him up? You gave your word. Now I'm going to hold you to it. Quit your job. Rah, rah, rah. That doesn't work, right? No. Wow. Okay, Charles, let me just look. All right, Am Amara's on the team. Let me call Amara. Amara, we're on this cross interdisciplinary. Can you carve out? I know it's not. And Amara says yes or no or counter offers. She gives a thumbs up, right? She's a hero. And that's what highly effective groups learn to do is to honor the word they are individually and to honor the word they are as a team. So if integrity is so fundamental to performance, why hasn't the word gotten around? What if we collapse integrity with morality? What if what we're saying is that integrity is neither good or bad? It's not a moral thing. We're saying it's a law. It's a positive law, kind of like gravity. Do we ever spend a lot of time debating good and bad gravity? You jump out of the airplane. It's not is it good gravity or bad gravity? It's just gravity. And the integrity of jumping out of an airplane successfully is that you need a parachute. So laws operate like gravity. They just are. When I honor my word, as we've distinguished it, I keep my word. And when I'm not keeping my word, I'm in communication as soon as I know. There's workability, but because we have it like it's a moral matter, concealment about the lack of integrity ensues and it reduces our capacity to restore it. These concealment methods are thematic. We go deep into this in the course. You know, that it's only what I said I would do. It's only the first of the six. Well, I didn't say I would. I didn't say I would be a nice person as your husband. I just said I'd be a lump of meat on the couch, right? No, she expects a little smile, a little how was your day, right? I'm all in, so I'm looking at all six aspects of my word. But it gets concealed. Integrity becomes only about keeping one's word. I'm perfect integrity. And then we start to make small promises. We only make promises that we know we can keep. Or thinking I'm a person of integrity. That's a big, that one gets in the way. I'm a good person. And not having the integrity to look in the mirror and go, wow, I really didn't, I didn't give my older boy the time he deserved last night. He needed to have a conversation. And I didn't put down the podcast. And I need to clean that up with him because he expects me to be his father and be there when he needs me. All right, integrity of an organization, leaving the personal and going to the level of an organization. An organization, any human system, for-profit, not-for-profit, medicine, all of it, is an integrity when it is whole and complete with respect to its word. This includes that nothing is hidden, no deception, no untruths, no violations of contracts or property rights, et cetera. That is to say, an organization honors its word internally between members of the organization and externally 
between the organization and those it deals with. This includes what is said by or on behalf of the organization to its members as well as outsiders. I'm an officer of UCLA. There's an expectation of comportment that goes with being a dean at the number one public research university in the country. So there's my personal integrity, get up and be who I say I'm gonna be, be for something bigger than myself. And then there's who my organization is to the world. So it's 8.07, I'm gonna do a little bit of a adjustment to where we are uh, in the interest of time. Um, let me just give you a high level about authenticity because this is the second foundational factor. Being authentic is being and acting consistent with, whole, with who you hold yourself out to be for others, including who you, hold your, you allow others to hold you to be and who you hold yourself to be for yourself. So, all right, we're gonna, there's some good stuff in there, but we're not gonna do it. I don't think we can do it, Kush. No, I know. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think. I don't think we. You know, we won't do it justice. So you know, like. So on what? So Dylan just covered for you. Okay. So what's integrity? It's the state of being whole, unbroken, um, and sound, perfect working condition. What's integrity for a human being? Well, integrity for a human being is a matter of their word. Nothing more. Nothing less. Well, there's six aspects of your word. Turns out, not just what you said you would do. There's, for example, the moral, legal, um, and ethical standards in groups in which you wish to enjoy membership. You know that driver's license you signed for, right? You, you actually signed that you wouldn't speed. Just so you know. Um, right. So six aspects of word, and the distinguished for you the difference between. Um, honoring one's word and keeping one's word, right? It, 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 that we're talking about honoring your word. It's, you can't keep your word all the time. Uh, in fact, the minute you think you're a person of integrity, that's when we know you're not, right? Yeah. And then um, the, I don't remember the, and then there's the matter of, well, okay, so, is integrity so, so important with regard to workability, right? Then how come word hasn't gotten around? And it's because we collapse it with morality, right? We don't need, so, the, you know, our, our, our suggestion is it's just like, it's, it's like gravity. It's not good or bad to have integrity. There's no metal, right? There's just workability available. Um, so, so that's, I think, I think we stop there, Dylan, and let them sort of take, take that with them into, you know, this matter of, okay, so school starts now, right? How are you going to approach that with integrity? Like, what, what is, what is there to do? Yeah. So we're, we're going to send you into the breakouts and I want to, I do want to circle back, you know, our why tonight, why we're here is that you have the best fall quarter ever. And that that fall quarter starts tonight. Graduate school starts tonight. So if you remember when I do academic probation counseling, it's not because we made an admissions mistake. That's not what trips people up. It's the complicated reality that comes with being a grown up going to school. Being a graduate student is a different stage of life than being an undergrad student. Some of you have been out of school one year. Some of you are, you know, just graduated and you're just straight into grad school. Some of you have been away five, 10, 15, 20 years. So getting ready, you know, dig the well before you're thirsty. Right. Okay. So we're going to send you into the groups. You're going to have 10 minutes. We're going to come back and we're going to, we're going to have about nine minutes left. Alphabetical first name. First person is also the timer. Two minutes each. Some people had to drop off. So there'll be fewer people in your groups. Where could you bring integrity to your grad school? What about your physical reality? Do you have a desk? Do you have an apartment? Do you have a computer? Do you have a place where your roommates are not going to mess with your stuff or your children are not going to move your homework? Defensive calendaring, in love with that. 
If it's not on your calendar, it doesn't exist. You're going to get so epically ninja about time management during grad school at UCLA. So there's space, there's time, and then there's people. It takes a village to create a graduate of UCLA. Who are your people? My mom, my dad, my sister, my brother, my best friend. Who is your first circle that you want to talk to them now? But Because school started tonight. Graduate school started tonight. So I'm going to call them Saturday and say, you know what? What are we going to do? Are we, Mom, is it going to be a once a month brunch? Because I will not sacrifice my relationship to you. You are too critical to my mental, spiritual, personal lifetime well-being. And I'm about to be busy as heck for the next four years. So what's it going to be? Is it going to be first Sunday brunch? Let's defensively calendar that, mom, because I want you to know what I'm doing while I'm doing it. And I want to come to you. And I know there's going to be a time where I, I need a shoulder to cry on. I want to quit. I'm going to need a little, you can do it, a little add a boy, add a girl, add a person, little, you know, get back in the arena, right? Okay. So let's just take integrity into the breakouts. Aaron, we ready to break away? We're ready. Rooms are open. All right. Enjoy. I have a family that was What is non negotiable? <laughs> no worries. And just having time with loved ones and keeping that like self care journal and being mindful of like my own thoughts and actions and keeping a record of that. So those are my, my group members. They're incredible. Feel free to chime in if you want. I hope I got everyone's insight right. But thanks again so much. And I apologize. I'm a horrible host, Carolina. I am trying to do two things at once. Obviously, I forgot to turn on record and I was fumbling around with sharing screen. Thank you. Thank you for representing Kusha's universe. Thank you for being a leader within your world. When I took the Being a Leader course with the MSW students, you know, the things that they're wrestling with, teen pregnancy, prison recidivism. It was, it was humbling. Like these are people who are giving their life to make the world work. And they're out there on the court where life doesn't work for people, where people really do need something. And so thank you for being someone who trains yourself to be somebody who can, who can give that away. And, and also Gary. So, um, all right. In the interest of time, Kush, uh, we have five minutes. Let me, I want to take one minute and give a little commercial and then we'll have four minutes and we'll, you and I can jointly land the plane. So I wanted to show you this razzle dazzle sizzle video because I'm a marketing guy from the business school, <laughs> but it's more important that we, um, that we not spend all our time doing that. So in the chat, because you are the marathon survivors and you made it to the end, you get these two links. So if you'd like to do something super fun, super delicious, that includes adult beverages out in the fresh air, Anderson hosts this small party called Palooza once a year. We haven't done it in three years. We're bringing it back. It's this Saturday and it is from 3 p.m. to sunset. And it's on the big, beautiful green lawn between Royce Hall and Powell Library, like the iconographic Chamber of Commerce Historical Center of UCLA. And there are two links in the chat, so please copy those and consider afterwards. You are cordially invited if you came tonight and Anderson would love to host you. Um, the first link is a one minute sizzle video, which gives you a sense of what Palooza is. And then if you would like to uh, get a ticket, you can bring a friend or family member and we would love to have you. We pay for the parking. It's a free event and you will get to meet mostly Anderson, but you will, no, not mostly Anderson. It's all Anderson. You will meet a whole bunch of happy MBA students and alumni, including our incoming class of 2025 and FEMBA and 2024 in EMBA and then the incoming MFE and MSBA. And we'd love to have you. And it's family friendly. There's bounce houses for the kids. We have three bounce houses. I could go on and on, but I will stop. So there's two invitations as we end our time together. The first invitation is to that. And the second invitation 
is, is a bigger, even more serious invitation. Oh my gosh, I have so many screens. If I can share screen again. So the first one, the first invitation is to Palooza number nine this Saturday, 3 p.m. to sunset, link in the chat. And the second invitation is a, uh, we're planting a seed that could be two, three or four years before it comes to fruition. But if this conversation, Gary said, oh, I wish we could do authenticity. If you enjoyed this conversation tonight and you would be interested in going through an entire course, the, the, full, the full experience, we are, Kush and I have been working on getting this course where we can offer it through UCLA Summer Session, which has the beautiful interdisciplinary advantage of being available to all UCLA graduate students. So um, what I intend to do is keep tonight's list and not forget where I put it <laughs> and send you an announcement next year or the year after. And if this could be part of your elective unit count towards any of your degrees, we would love to see you again. So those are the two invitations. And as we land the plane, thank you. Thank you for your generous listening. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for who you are today. Thank you that you're willing to look at creating a creative future, a context bigger than yourself, that you're willing to give your word to pursue the graduate degrees that you're willing to give, that you're here. I tripped over my words. Me stop talk now. Kush, last words are yours. Well, I just, you know, I, I encourage you to go out and, and, and lead yourself. That, that, that's what there is to do. Don't, don't, don't sell your, don't sell your word out to yourself out. That, that's really what, what, what I would leave you with is we sell ourselves out first. Honor yourself. That's all I got. Yeah, and come join us, summer 2023. It's an experience over which you will not get. Awesome. So on behalf of our committee, on behalf of uh, Gonzalo Frasius, who empowered me to have this conversation, um, thank you so much. We are complete. We can hang out for a few minutes, but um, the event is complete. Thank you for your gracious listening. And thank you for your commitment to who you want to be in the world and the difference I know you're going to make for the world that my children get to live in. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks and bye.